Hey friends, welcome back to Currently Workshopping, a show where we work through the perils and frisant of being alive together. I'm your host Cece, and this week, well, this week I'm reflecting on why I regret lifestyle blogging and why lifestyle vlogging seems like the MLM of online content. Easy to get into, but hard to find financial success in and with many, many drawbacks that aren't apparent when one first starts vlogging. This episode is a bit more personal than the others, and that's because I realized that I'm heading into the last few episodes of this season, so I need to mix up formats and try some new things while I still can. I'm planning on a mass reevaluation in January of what projects I'm putting my time into, so I want to make sure I get a good feel of various podcast episode types for that evaluation. And if you have been enjoying the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe, as that will certainly go into the factors I consider when deciding whether to continue with the pod or repurpose some of its elements into something else. So as this season wraps up, I'm going to do a future episode talking about the publishing process thus far, and also do one episode with just a Q&A. If you have a question about publishing or just a general question that you'd like me to address on the Q&A episode, please send them via email to hello at ccshia.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at ccshia.com, which you can find the spelling of by taking a look at, well, your computer or phone. But for this episode, I'll go into how I first approached creating content and why I got sucked into lifestyle vlogs so easily. Throw in a little mimetic theory from Girard, because why not? And then present three pitfalls of the genre due to the life commodification the genre inevitably forces on creators. Let's roll. If you're listening to this, you probably know what lifestyle vlogging is. This peculiar phenomenon ushered in by YouTube where quote unquote normal people record their lives as they live it, edit those clips on their computer, and then upload those video logs onto the internet. TikTok has carried on the vlogging medium, albeit in a shorter format, and this particular 60 second TikTok vlog was actually the source of my first experiences with online virality. Back in 2020, I was really, really new to content creation. And I mostly made content that mimicked other people's contents, not like plagiarism or copying them, but I would try to make videos in the style of certain videos that came across my feed. Humans in general are really, really good at imitating. Children in particular are just absolute sponges of behavior and learning. And I remember intentionally copying others from a very early age. When I was in kindergarten and new to America, my mom would sometimes curse in front of me shiitake mushrooms, you know, when negative events happened, like if the car in front of us stopped too abruptly and she had to slam on the brakes, she would yell shiitake mushroom. I didn't know the word at all because, well, I was five and I also just didn't know English at the time, but I did gather from her cursing that what she said was something you say when you're upset with something. So lo and behold, the next time a classmate did something, I said the same thing that she did shiitake mushrooms. And I cannot properly convey to you how confusing the aftermath of me saying shiitake mushrooms was. My classmate was rather incredulous and asked me what I had said, and I responded again, shiitake mushrooms. And then their eyes went really wide, and they ran to the teacher, who already did not like me, let me tell you, and told her that I had said a swear word. The teacher then pulled me aside and asked me what I had said, and I, not knowing that this was even a bad word, okay, I honestly did not know English very well at this time, that it's almost laughable to me now that she was trying to explain to me in English that something I said in English was wrong. Just, God, ESL in the mid-90s. What a joy of a time. So the teacher pulls me aside and says to me very firmly, that is not a word we say in school or something to that effect. And I didn't know why at all. All I knew was that my mom said shiitake mushrooms when unpleasant things happen and I was copying her. I don't think kids copying adults is anything new, but I do think that immigrants of a certain age can all remember actively copying others. This is going to sound really silly, but when I was pretty young, eight, nine, I remember seeing a friend's older brother bite his nails. I had never seen anyone do that before, but I thought he was cool at the time. He had a lot of cool Pokemon cards, you know? So I tried biting my nails too. I'd never done it before and didn't know why anyone would do it, but I saw him do it and I tried it. And that began my probably 15 year battle with trying to stop biting my nails. Wild, right? It's a habit I still can't shake entirely because now I just pick off my own skin and it really all goes back to me mimicking my friend's older brother. 
Point is, I have never been that great at knowing who I was, who Cece was, without trying on a lot of different things first. In fifth grade, I even changed my handwriting no fewer than two times. Like, I would sit at my desk and practice letters over and over until I forced my handwriting to change because I would all of a sudden want it to look like someone else's. My entire life has mainly been a series of trying on different outfits, literal and metaphorical, and seeing how I feel about them until I figure out what feels right to me. And this knack of trying on different outfits, different modes, it was very well and alive in creating content as well. One of my earliest short stories, which I wrote for a middle school assignment, was essentially a knockoff of Agatha Christie's, and then there were none. One of my short stories in high school was an exploration of pedophilia after I read Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita. So it really should be no surprise that my first vlogs on TikTok, my first pieces of content, were really me copying other people's content. I saw that lifestyle vlogs were generally beautiful with aesthetic locales, lo-fi music, and casual displays of luxury, although there also existed the chaotic vlog, a faster paced, fast talking montage with fast cuts and a lot of camera movement. I also loved Hank Green on TikTok. I think he's a great educator on social media. And he always did that thing where he would like zoom in and out randomly while talking. So for a few months, I also did that, even though I had no idea why. Was it to keep the audience's attention, introduce visual tension, make viewers nauseated? I don't know. I honestly did not know the reasoning behind why I made the things I did. I only knew that I was copying what I had seen, the same way I tried writing in the style of a random font I found that I liked. A French philosopher, René Girard, spent a lot of time thinking about this human tendency to copy. One of his quotes is, man is the creature who does not know what to desire, and he turns to others in order to make up his mind. We desire what others desire because we imitate their desires. Girard, and I know the proper French pronunciation is something like René Girard, but I am god-awful at my R's in the Romance languages, and I got a three on my AP French exam, so I'm gonna spare you all here and just stick with this like butchered Americanized pronunciation. I am so sorry. So Girard's theory wasn't so much that humans do mimic one another more generally, but he focused on the mimetic nature of desire. That is, we look around ourselves to see what other people desire and then that forms our own desires. So if we see lifestyle vlogs showcasing a baddie or a soft girl or dark academia or whatever is the new aesthetic term of the day, that triggers the mimetic tendency of our desires. And now we also desire the baddie or soft girl or dark academia or whatever aesthetic. This is probably made worse by modern algorithms also, which tend to show you similar content as you watched before, so it really reinforces mimetic desire by showing you even more of what you had seen previously. I think lifestyle vlogs tend to be an accessible gateway to creation, right? Which is why we see so many vlogs. After watching enough lifestyle vlogs, you kind of start developing this mimetic desire to also make one because it's clear that so many others desire and like vlogging. It kind of feels like lifestyle vlogging is the MLM of online content, you know? Once you watch enough, you start buying items recommended by the vlogger using their affiliate links and maybe even buying their vlogging equipment, camera, microphone, lights, using their affiliate links. I know it's not a perfect comparison, but there's something there. Some overlap between MLMs and lifestyle vlogging, aspirational vlogging and selling things in an MLM manner, which I do think is quite different from sales in other contexts. And probably some lifestyle vloggers actually are in MLMs. I'm gonna have to give it more thought and research, but let me know if you think I'm onto something or if I'm just reaching here. So we have this ecosystem where lifestyle vlogging is kind of like the gateway to creating. And you also have lifestyle vloggers telling their audience, hey, you can do it too. You just need this equipment. This is how I edit all of that. Seems easy, right? The problem with lifestyle vlogging though, and I've been giving this a lot of thought as I evaluate my content output and think more intentionally about what the hell I'm doing here. The problem with lifestyle vlogging is that it is a crystallization of life at one moment, whether it be a day, week, or month. Which also means that when life changes, as it inevitably does, this tricky, wily thing we call life, the lifestyle vlog will necessarily also change. And any major life change, like moving to a different city, getting a divorce, having a baby, quitting a job, will necessarily change lifestyle vlogs. Now, this makes sense. When you commodify your life in the form of lifestyle vlogs, even if you don't monetize it, that commodification for content purposes changes your relationship with your life. You no longer merely live your life. 
you commodify it. Each minute, each hour is now something that you can commodify by recording and packaging. Before I get deeper into it, I do want to say that this life commodification phenomenon isn't solely due to YouTube or social media. One can commodify life sans social media, and I would argue that writers, filmmakers, artists, and musicians very much could commodify their lives in the analog era. Like, sure, some writers and musicians probably did experience nothing IRL and then went on to create fantastic pieces about experiences which did not happen. But for the most part, particularly given the way we judge artists along with art nowadays, the experiencing is part and parcel with the creating. So life commodification is nothing new, but I do think that social media and the internet more generally has democratized who is able to commodify their life. Now, everyone can vlog. We can all vlog. Isn't it easy? You just live your life and then you can commodify it. You don't even need to put in much additional effort. You too can gain social capital and or money by simply existing. And doesn't that sound nice? Yes. Yes, it does, until we get to the downsides of life commodification. So I think there are three main issues with life commodification via the lifestyle vlog. There are other issues more generally with life commodification. I'm thinking like Trisha Paytas, Tana Manjo, but let's just stick with how this particular medium, the lifestyle vlog, commodifies life. First, there's the problem caused by precession of the simulacrum, which I talked about previously in the episode about scammers. When the vlog, this digital output, has more meaning to us than life as it happens in the moment, that is the simulacrum preceding reality. And I have totally been in conversations with people where the main consideration for going somewhere or doing something is, well, it'll, it'll make for a good vlog. And before you get all high and mighty about it, this isn't unique or specific to lifestyle vloggers. Normal people do this all the time too, which is why some of the most beautiful places in the world are actually nightmares when you actually go, because there are lines and lines of regular people lining up to take one breathtaking photo. We let simulacra precede our reality all the time. Even when we didn't have cameras, people wanted the simulacra to take precedence in oil paintings, Arthurian legends, hell, even stick figure drawings by cavemen. You think everything they drew on those walls actually happened? Really? The problem with letting the simulacra take precedence isn't that it's happening, because you know what, I think there's something positive about being able to romanticize your own life in hindsight and also laugh about this silly, almost universal human desire for self-portraiture. We have had selfies in some form or other as long as humanity has been alive. It's wonderful. It's cute. It's MBD. The problem, though, with precession of the simulacra is when we start solely living our lives for the simulacrum. Like... I'm not gonna lie, when I saw how well my day in the life as a lawyer vlogs did, it legitimately made me want to be a lawyer forever. Like, I imagined it in my mind where I rose through the ranks of the firm and one day, four to six years from then, I could make a vlog of my self-making partner. I kid you not, that thought actually did cross my mind. I saw the view count, which I assume reflects other people's desire for that thing that I was showing, and it imbued my own desire. What is that if not the utmost definition of commodifying your own life? Where I was thinking about commodifying my career, like, gosh, I never really thought much about how family vloggers or mommy vloggers come about, but in some way, I kind of get it. If babies are what people want to see, then it also kind of impacts what you think you want to see and what you think you want to make. And I would argue that it's rational to commodify your own life like that if that's what you so choose. Putting aside the morals and ethics of involving other people in your career, but if you really do want to live your life for the camera, I guess that's cool. Who am I to stop you? What happens most often, though, isn't so much of this informed choice to start living for the camera. Mimetic desire isn't an explicit process, and that's what makes it so dangerous. It happens subconsciously without us knowing. We end up mimicking desires if we don't pay attention. This happened to me all the time in law school, too. I went in barely knowing what big law was and wanting to go in-house at a tech company. By 3L, I was deep in the big law marketing machine and considering applying to federal clerkships, even though I knew I didn't want to be a litigator. How did that all come about? Well, duh. I spent three years in the company of other people's desires, and it began affecting my own. 
This is always the most dangerous component of law school that I try to warn people about. No path in law is bad if it's your own, but the problem is that law school always makes you feel like you should be doing what someone else is doing, what others are telling you to do, and that can lead to a hell of a three years as you question and re-question your priorities and goals. I can't tell you the number of times I changed my mind on things because of mimetic desire, probably as many times as I changed my handwriting in fifth grade. Point is, lifestyle vlogging is all fun and games until the simulacrum dictates your life when you didn't want it to. It's great sharing your life until you go to an event because you think it'll have cute footage and photos only to be ignored by everyone and stand there by yourself for most of the time and then also have to pay $150 for cheap jewelry that you go back to return two days later. Which is totally not a true story, I swear. <laughs> But okay, second major issue with lifestyle vlogging. It opens you up to that critique that all creators loathe and fear. You're no longer relatable. This is because relatability is relative. There is no such thing as universal relatability. There is, however, relatable to a majority or relatable to a particular demographic, but it just isn't possible to be relatable to everyone out there. Going back to my earlier point about the inevitable changing nature of life and its attendant impact on lifestyle content, if relatability to a certain group was a focus point of someone's content, then it makes a lot of sense that when one's life changes, their lifestyle vlogs will shift in relatability with respect to that original group. And I am 100% guilty of this. I have this developing theory, really developing, so this is giving this currently workshopping name a run for its money, but I have this developing theory that relatability really means two concrete steps that I can visualize away from where I am currently. For example, grad school content or getting married content are still relatable to people in high school because those steps are two concrete steps away from where they currently are. But content beyond that, like getting divorced, switching careers, is less relatable because it's more than two steps away from their current position. But when you are a fresh college grad, all of a sudden getting divorced content and switching careers content seems much more relatable because you just got one step closer to those potential life events. I mean, I remember looking at people in their 30s when I was 18 and thinking to myself, there is no way I could ever relate to them. I also definitely had some deeper issues, like I was one of those people who wanted to commit suicide at 40, but that is a whole other podcast episode, I'm sorry. I was not well as a teenager, but then again, who was? Okay, so yes. A uh, downside of lifestyle vlogging is that lifestyle vloggers will one day get that dreaded comment about them becoming less relatable because that is honestly just going to be a fact of life. You will change and your audience will also change. This isn't all that dissimilar from maintaining friendships with friends from middle school or high school. Like, yes, you were close friends once, but that doesn't preclude you from growing apart. It hurts in the same way that it hurts to hear from a high school friend about how you've changed, you know? It's not so much the fact of change, but it's the bringing up the fact of change because change is always kind of sad, even if it's for the better. I still get sad sometimes about how I've changed since high school, even though I know it's for the better because I just keep on thinking about the reality that change means that I've lost something, even if what I've gained is far more valuable to me. Change is still sad. And that brings me to the third issue of lifestyle vlogging, which I really think is the biggest issue for me and that sends me into a dizzying panic and spiral in so many ways. Self-identity threat. What do I mean by that? Okay, so you know when you're dating someone and you're vibing and connecting and then one day you ask them what they like about you and they say something like, you also like video games and you smell good and you're just like, huh? Because while those facts may be true about yourself, they're not the things that you may want your romantic partner to like about you. Unless, of course, those are the exact things you do want your romantic partner to like about you, in which case, God bless and Godspeed. But at least for myself, I know that there are some qualities about me that I want my friends and romantic partners to appreciate in me. And it feels really crushing when I realize that they don't exactly appreciate those things about me. It's a particularly alienating experience, I think, to realize that what you want others to see you for and what they actually see you for may not be the same thing. 
This is the same trap that I think lifestyle vlogging can fall into, right? And in fact, was very much a thing I experienced through lifestyle vlogging. Lifestyle vlogging is by definition a wider look into someone's life, more so than education or subject specific content. When I watch someone's Final Cut Pro tutorial, which I watched a lot of, I'm learning a lot about Final Cut Pro, but not necessarily gaining a wider look into the person teaching the tutorial. And by giving others a wider look into your life, you also lose the ability to control the particular aspects that others like about your life. You can't vlog a whole day and then be like, but I really want you to like me for that Final Cut Pro tutorial I did in the middle. It just doesn't work that way. So here I am making my mimetic lifestyle vlogs in 2020, 2021, and I think that people enjoy watching me because of my work ethic or wit or openness. But once I quit, I realized, no, a lot of people actually just liked me for my job. And that was kind of crushing, you know? And it's kind of crushing in the way that, you know, when you're a kid, you will go up to a parent and maybe show them something that you made or did, and you want them to compliment you for something. And instead they say, oh, you look really nice today. Or like, oh, you're so cute. And you're like, yes, that is true. But also that's not what I'm trying to communicate to you here. And that's not what I want you to appreciate me for. And that's, that's kind of how I feel. In the same way that realizing that someone that you were dating liked you for how tall you were or the fact that you were the same ethnicity or religion or that you were hot or that you went to quote unquote good schools, um, while all those things may be true, it's also just disappointing sometimes to hear that that's what someone likes about you. I don't know if I'm making sense, but I've felt this a lot throughout my life. I've been in friend groups where I felt like I kept on getting invited to stuff, not because of what I wanted them to like me for, but more because it said something about what they liked about me and what they wanted. And I've certainly dated people who liked me because I was petite and good at banter, when in fact, I wanted to be liked for my intelligence or kindness or something. And absolutely, absolutely with my parents, I think I grew up wanting them to like me for certain qualities, certain things that I did. And instead, I grew up feeling that they loved me because of my academic achievements. There's just a glaring mismatch here that I don't think we talk about all the time. There is significant value in finding people who like you for what you want to be liked for, and vice versa. It made me think a lot about couples who get divorced, right? When one of them gains substantial weight or loses their job. And it's like, okay, one party changed. So what does that mean? Is that the end? Was their physique or job or what have you so important to the other person that losing that factor means that the marriage is untenable? I don't really know, but I think it's an important question to ask yourself and your romantic partner and friends. Like, what are the core components and commonalities of the relationship, just so everyone's on the same page? When someone doesn't like you for what you want them to like you for, but rather for what they want to like you for, I think there's always a danger of simulacrum dominance, right? In that your friend or partner or parent likes the idea of you more so than the actual you, the simulacrum of you more than the reality of you. I experienced this a lot with my parents, where I always got this acute sense that they would like me better if I were a robot, an automaton, with all of my outward characteristics of success, but none of my internal thoughts or struggles. And that really messed with my head for many, many years, let me tell you. So in retrospect, I think I started lifestyle vlogging without a real appreciation for all of the negatives and risks that it carries. I got lulled into the prevailing narrative that lifestyle vlogging is the easiest, all you have to do is just live your life, and seduced by the idea that one could simply make money by existing, when the reality is that it opens you up to way more emotional and mental risk than I would have guessed in the beginning. Like, Lifestyle vlogging is a trap. It's the MLM of content. It is something you see others do and then turn around and say, hey, you know, you can do it too. Is that not an MLM? And like an MLM, it does look easy. So you buy into it without fully understanding all the costs and downsides. So will I still lifestyle vlog? Honestly, yes, because I do like doing it. And it's fun and creative in the same way that I think Reflecting and writing about past experiences is fun and creative, but I do think I need to stop aspiring for relatability in vlogs or project so much on my audience about what they might like about me and my content. I really can't control that, you know? It's almost silly of me to post vlogs and think viewers will like me for my cutting wit when they might actually like, I don't know, New York City, which is totally fair. Like, you can't get mad if someone you're dating likes you because you have good hair and like Indian food too, right? It's their prerogative 
prerogative to like you for whatever reasons they like you for. This whole process is a two-way projection onto each other. And I've come to realize that I have projected a whole hell of a lot onto the nameless viewers as well, which I should probably stop doing. That's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed this episode and have some more tools to help you think through life commodification and lifestyle blogging, as well as how your own desires might be shaped by mimetic theory. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe, and send me your questions to hello at ccshia.com for the future Q&A episodes. I'll see you next time.